Cullen Montgomery Baker was a notorious and merciless murderer who left a trail of death across the American frontier. As a Confederate guerrilla during the Civil War, he refused to abandon his violent ways after the war's end. Instead, he targeted Reconstructionists, killed former slaves, and spread terror through Texas and Arkansas for a span of four years. Born on June 22nd of 1835 in Weekly County, Tennessee, to John and Elizabeth Baker, Cullen actually grew up in Clarksville, Arkansas after his family relocated there. A few years later, they settled in Davis County, Texas, where Cullen's father obtained a land grant of 640 acres. Despite this, the family remained impoverished and Cullen, often teased at school for his humble attire, developed his fighting spirit. He acquired an old pistol and a rusty but functional rifle, honing his skills with these weapons until he became highly proficient. At the age of 15, Cullen had his first taste of whiskey, which fueled his quick temper and led him to provoke fights with boys and men who crossed his path. Spending much of his time in saloons, he gained a reputation as a belligerent, quarrelsome, and mean-spirited individual. During a brawl, he was struck unconscious by Morgan Culp, who had hit him in the head with a tomahawk. Although this incident momentarily subdued his temper, it did not last. In January of 1854, still sporting a bandage on his head, Baker married 17-year-old Martha Jane Petty and settled into a seemingly quiet life as a farmer. However, just eight months later, he reverted to his old ways. One night, fueled by alcohol, he engaged in a verbal altercation with a young man named Stalkup. Enraged, Baker lashed out and nearly beat Stalkup to death with a whip. As a result, Baker was charged with the crime and sought retribution by shooting one of the witnesses, a man named Wesley Bailey, in both of his legs with a shotgun, leaving him wounded outside of his home. Bailey succumbed to his injuries just a few days later. Fearing arrest for murder, Baker fled to Perry County, Arkansas, seeking refuge from his uncle, Thomas Young, where he stayed for nearly two years. During his time in Arkansas, Baker fatally stabbed a man named Wortham during an argument about horses in 1856. He then returned to Texas, but learned that he was still wanted for murder of Bailey. Meanwhile, his wife Martha gave birth to a daughter named Louisa Jane on May 24th of 1857. Baker briefly returned to Texas to retrieve his wife and child, but never saw his daughter again. Tragedy struck when Martha died on July 2nd of 1860, plunging Baker into grief. However, his, so his sorrow didn't prevent him pr from proposing to Martha's 16-year-old sister, Belle Foster, just two months later. Bell rejected his advances and married another man, a man named Thomas Orr, a school teacher and political activist. Baker began harassing Orr, attempting to start fights, assaulting him with a tree limb, and even verbally abusing him in front of his students. As Reconstruction commenced in Arkansas and Texas, Baker developed a deep disdain for the changes taking place. Partnering with outlaw Lee Rames, Baker formed a gang based in the treacherous Sulphur River Bottoms near Bright Star, Arkansas. Engaging in robbery and murder, the gang claimed lives of at least 30 individuals showing no mercy regardless of their allegiance. They often ambushed and shot victims in the back or outnumbered them. Baker's reign of terror extended to Texas where he killed John Sammons, the murderer of Seth Rames, a member of his gang, and Lee Rames' brother. He also took lives of W.G. Kirkman, a Reconstruction official, and George W. Barron, who had participated in a posse seeking his capture. The gang continued their lawless spree into Queen City, Texas, and Texarkana, Arkansas, right there on the border of Texas and Arkansas, hence the name Texarkana. On June 1st of 1867, Baker visited Cass County, Texas, where he entered the Rowden General Store, absconded with items, and refused to pay. The store's owner, John Rowden, confronted Baker at his house, demanding payment while armed with a shotgun. Baker promised to return and settle the debt, but on June 5th, he instead killed Rowden. Fleeing back to Arkansas, Baker encountered a Union sergeant at a ferry and recognized him and shot and killed the officer. Although a private managed to escape and report the murder, Union forces relentlessly pursued Baker. 
On July 25th of 1867, an argument broke out between Baker and several Union soldiers near New Boston, Texas, escalating into a violent gunfight. Baker sustained an arm injury, but succeeded in killing Army Private Albert E. Titus. This act resulted in a $1,000 reward for his capture, dead or alive. In December of 1867, Baker joined forces with a group planning a raid on Howell Smith's farm in Bright Star, Arkansas. Smith had recently hired freed slaves, which incited Baker and his cohorts. During the attack, one of Smith's daughters was stabbed and another was clubbed and a man lost his life. However, Smith fought back, triggering a shootout that left several raiders injured, including Baker, who suffered a gunshot wound to the leg. On October 24th of 1868, Baker and his gang were reported to be involved in the murders of Major P.J. Andrews, Lieutenant H.F. Willis, and an unidentified black man in Little Rock, Arkansas. Lee Rames, Baker's co-leader, grew skeptical of Baker's leadership and believed his actions would lead to the gang's downfall. Rames defied Baker, who ultimately backed down, resulting in the gang's dissolve. Uh, they were dissolved in December of 1868. All members except Dummy Kirby, which is the first time I've heard somebody call that, uh, Dummy Kirby sided with Rames. Baker and Kirby sought refuge with Baker's in-laws in Bloomberg, Texas in January of 1869. It was there that both Cullen Baker and Dummy Kirby met their demise on January 6th of 1869. The exact circumstances of their deaths remain a little unknown. Uh, according to one account, Baker's father-in-law and his acquaintances laced a bottle of whiskey and some of the food with uh, poison, uh, causing both the men to die. Afterwards, the bodies were riddled with bullets. Another version suggests that Thomas Orr, who was with Baker and had a long-standing feud, led a group of men to ambush Baker and Kirby at the Foster's home, resulting in their deaths. Following their demise, the bodies were paraded through Bloomberg before being publicly displayed at a U.S. Army post near Jefferson, Texas. Thomas Orr reportedly collected a portion of the reward money offered for Baker. Cullen Baker was laid to rest in Oakwood Cemetery in Jefferson, Texas, and despite his desertion from Morgan's squadron, a Confederate cavalry unit, um, he was it's still indicated on his grave marker. Some people actually romanticize Baker for defending the Southern honor, and his record proves him to be an unrelenting killer who murdered anyone who provoked him, regardless of their affiliations. There are some estimates that suggest that Cullen Baker was responsible for, for 50 to 60 deaths, uh, earning him a place as one of the most merciless killers in history um, and recognized by authorities and historians alike. Seaborn Barnes, famously known as Nubbins Colt, emerged from the shadows of Texas as a notorious outlaw riding alongside the legendary Sam Bass. Hailing from the rugged territory of Cass County, Texas, in the year 1849, Barnes was a product of a life untouched by formal education. Illiteracy consumed his existence as he ventured into the realm of cowboy during his tender teenage years. Fueled by his inability to tolerate the potent brews of the saloon, he found himself embroiled in countless brawls that reverberated through the dimly lit establishments. The consequences of his fiery temperament landed him behind the cold bars of Fort Worth Penitentiary, serving a year's sentence for a fateful shooting incident that unfolded when he was just 17 years old. Not long after his release, the relentless arms of the law closed in on Barnes once again in 1874, this time in Callahan County. Yet, like a phantom dancing in the moonlit darkness, he managed to elude their grasp slipping away from captivity. It was in the year of 1878 that Barnes forged an alliance with the formidable Sam Bass Gang, swiftly ascending to the coveted position of Bass's chief lieutenant. Together, they embarked on a spree of audacious train robberies during the vibrant spring months of the same year. However, destiny twisted its hand when they set their sights on the bank in the town of Round Rock, Texas, just outside of Austin, uh, on July 19th of 1878. But the gang's destiny actually had a cruel secret. The sun-drenched day of July 19th of 1878 saw the ambitious outlaws set their sights on the treasured vault of the Round Rock Bank in Round Rock, Texas. 
Unbeknownst to them, a serpent lurked in their midst. A new recruit named Jim Murphy, whose heart had been swayed by the allure of betrayal. Murphy had turned informant, his whispers reaching the ears of the vigilant and always watching Texas Rangers who were lying in wait. The stage was set for the ultimate confrontation, the dance of bullets and the clash of fates. In that fateful moment, a merciless hail of gunfire claimed the life of Seaborn Barnes. A bullet to the head extinguished him instantly. Meanwhile, Sam Bass, battered and bloodied, clung to life with unwavering tenacity. Mounting his steed, he escaped the clutches of the Round Rock, accompanied by a few rogue named Frank Jackson, vanishing into the abyss of uncertainty. Yet, the following day unveiled the harrowing truth. Bass, the wounded outlaw who dared to defy death, lay lifeless in the ground. His fate sealed by the revelation of Jim Murphy, the turncoat whose treachery had set in motion the events. Frank Jackson, a shadow in the wind, disappeared into oblivion, leaving behind only whispers and faded memories. Seaborn Barnes found eternal solace in the sacred grounds of Round Rock Cemetery, where he was laid to rest beside his fallen comrade, Sam Bass, and etched upon his weathered tombstone, a testament to his unwavering loyalty stood the words that echoed through the ages. He served as the steadfast anchor guiding Sam Bass through the stormy seas of their outlaw legacy." End quote. Ann Bassett, a remarkable rancher with a fiery spirit, commanded attention amidst the rugged landscapes of Browns Hole, Colorado. Nestled near the border of Wyoming, Colorado, and Utah, this isolated region possessed an air of lawlessness, beckoning outlaws and renegades like moths to a flame. It stood as a notorious haven for horse thieves, cattle rustlers, and notorious outlaws of the area, rivaling the infamous hideouts of Hole in the Wall, Wyoming, and Robber's Roost in Utah. Here, amid the untamed wilderness, Anne's story unfolded. Born on May 12th of 1878 to parents Herb and Elizabeth Chamberlain Bassett, they presided over a ranch that epitomized both the isolation and allure of the area. Their humble abode perched on the edge of the wild frontier, welcoming danger and adventure with open arms. Her father, Herb, a man unassuming yet harboring hidden connections, conducted business with outlaws who straddled the blurred lines between lawlessness and legend. Among his acquaintances were the infamous Butch Cassidy, the audacious Harvey Kid Curry Logan, and an enigmatic Black Jack Ketchum. Through horse trades, beef sales, and provisional transactions, Herb danced on the fringes of legitimacy, his activities serving as a lifeline to those living on the wild side. Despite the untamed nature of the surroundings, the Bassett sisters, Anne and Josie, exuded a rare elegance that bellied their rustic upbringing. These fetching young women received education befitting of the highest echelons of society, attending esteemed boarding schools that cultivated their intelligence and grace. Yet, their father Herb instilled into them practical skills that set them apart from their refined peers. They mastered the arts of riding and roping and shooting and became adept at the ways of the untamed frontier. It was within this vivid tapestry of wild beauty and uncharted possibilities that Anne and Josie encountered the legendary outlaws. Butch Cassidy, and his audacious gang, the Wild Bunch. Drawn to the sisters' radiant allure, their intelligence, and the articulate voices, these outlaws found solace in company with the companionship of Anne and Josie. At the tender age of 15, Anne, too, succumbed to the allure of Butch Cassidy's charismatic presence, embarking on a passionate romance that defied societal norms. Meanwhile, Josie found herself entangled with Elza Lay, further weaving the threads of love and adventure into their lives. Even the outlaws Ben Kilpatrick and Will News Carver, later infamous members of the Wild Bunch gang, courted the captivating Bassett sisters drawn by their irresistible charm. Amidst the backdrop of their unconventional lifestyle, Anne's father, a man content to fade into the background, entrusted the ranch's operations to Elizabeth, Anne's indomitable mother. Faced with encroaching cattle barons who sought to seize control of Brown's Hole, 
Elizabeth, driven by her own feud with these powerful men, dabbled in a touch of cattle rustling. An audacious act of defiance, it earned her the title Queen of the Rustlers, amongst those who whispered her name in hushed tones. As Anne grew into her own, she embraced her mother's righteous fury, directing it squarely at the Two Bar Ranch, a symbol of the oppressive cattle barons. Her actions spoke louder than her words, and she liberally helped herself to their prized cattle, becoming a thorn in the side of those who sought to dominate the untamed frontier. Whispers and accusations painted a darker portrait of Anne in her mother's defiance. Rumors swirled that they sent two bar cattle hurtling off treacherous cliffs in an act of spiteful revenge. These tales reached the ears of the cattle barons, their wrath demanding action. It was then that they employed the services of Tom Horn, a man who possessed the reputation as a formidable as the mountains that cradle Brown's Hole. Tasked with infiltrating this wild domain, Horn set forth on a mission to silence the defiant voices that refused to yield. When Matt Rush, Isom Dart, and other ranchers stood their ground, their resolve unyielding, Horn resorted to violence. His bullets felled those who dared challenge his authority, their lives cut short amid the echoing canyons and vast expanse of Brown's Hole. In a twist of fate, Anne's path veered towards marriage with H. Bernard, the manager of Two Bar Ranch, sparking a storm of controversy. Their union ignited a powder keg of tension, resulting in Bernard's swift dismissal from his post. For six years, their relationship stood as a testament to the complexities of love amid the wild frontier. Yet, Anne's spirit remained untamed, her rebellious nature compelling her to snatch cattle from the very ranch she had married into, a defiant act that would forever etch her name into the annals of infamy. When she faced trial for her audacity, the courtroom drama unfolded, gripping the hearts and minds of all who witnessed it. Ultimately, Anne emerged from the crucible of justice, acquitted and unscathed, her resilience an enduring testament to her domitable spirit. In 1928, Anne embarked on a new chapter of her life, bidding farewell to the rugged landscapes that had shaped her existence. She wed a man named Frank Willis, who brought stability and a sense of settling to her tumultuous journey. Together, they brought solace in a small town nestled in the southwestern reaches of Utah, where the vast horizons whispered a quieter existence. There, Anne found respite from her windswept drama of her youth, cultivating a peaceful existence that would carry her through the twilight of her life. Though some sought to intertwine her story with that of Etta Place, an elusive figure of the Wild West, historians have largely dismissed such claims, allowing Anne Bassett to etch her name in as a singular force in the annals of frontier history. And so at the age of 78, Anne departed this world, leaving behind a legacy that would forever illuminate the untamed spirit that thrived within the heart of the American West. Isaac Ike Black, a notorious outlaw, wreaked havoc in the territories of Kansas and Oklahoma during the late 19th century. Initially, Black's criminal exploits began with cattle theft in Kansas, which eventually led to his incarceration in the Kansas Penitentiary. Upon his release, he sought refuge in Oklahoma, where fate brought him together with another wanted outlaw named Zip Wyatt. Wyatt had a criminal record for injuring two individuals in Oklahoma and murdering Deputy Sheriff Andrew Balfour in Kansas. United with their shared fugitive status, Black and Wyatt formed an audacious gang that embarked on a spree of robberies throughout the region. One notable incident occurred in November of 1893, when they successfully looted the High Tower store and post office in Arapahoe, Oklahoma. To evade capture, Black and Wyatt sought refuge in the treacherous Gypsum Hills, where their wives admirably supported them by providing food and supplies. As their criminal activities escalated, they became prime suspects in nearly every crime committed within the territory, promptly uh, intensifying a manhunt by the lawmen of the area. Rumors circulated that Ike Black and Zip Wyatt had aligned themselves with the infamous Doolin Dalton gang, allegedly taking part in the daring Rock Island train robbery in Dover, Oklahoma on April 3rd of 1895. However, there's no concrete evidence that was ever confirmed this claim. On June 3rd of 1895, 
An outlaw gang, potentially including Black and Wyatt, targeted the store and post office in Fairview, Oklahoma, ransacking the premise and making off of valuables, goods, and three horses. U.S. Deputy Marshal Gus Hadwinger and J.K. Reynolds, Woods County Sheriff Clay McGrath, and Deputy Marion Hildreth promptly gave chase, eventually cornering the gang in a concealed cave near the county line. A fierce gunfight ensued, resulting in Black sustaining a foot injury and Wyatt being shot in the left arm. Despite their injuries, the outlaws managed to elude capture. The relentless pursuit continued with the number of lawmen seeking them growing to nearly 200 people. On July 26, 1895, Black and Wyatt targeted the Oxley Post Office and store in Oklahoma. Their ill-fated heist yielded a meager loot of $35 and some supplies. However, their identities were recognized during the robbery, prompting a posse to form and pursue them the next day. Tracked to a location near Salt Creek, approximately six miles northwest of Oxley, the outlaws found themselves in yet another firefight. Black suffered a flesh wound to the head, but both men miraculously managed to escape. Their horses had fled during the chaos, leaving them stranded on foot. Desperate means for an escape uh, were needed. Black and Wyatt reached a farm five miles west of Okini, Oklahoma, not sure if I said that right, Okine, Oklahoma, where they absconded with horses and a cart. Another posse, led by Robert Callison, the former constable of Forest Township, was assembled determined to bring the outlaws to justice. The pursuit led them to a canyon on July 28th, where gunfire erupted once again, resulting in Frank Pope, a member of the posse, being shot in the leg. Despite the exchange of bullets, Black and White again narrowly eluded escape. The original posse joined forces with another from Alva, Oklahoma, led by Deputy Sheriff Marion Hildreth, who continued the relentless pursuit southeast. Eventually, Black and Wyatt sought refuge in a makeshift shack located approximately four miles east of Cantonment, which is present-day Canton. On August 1st of 1895, when the posse finally closed in on them, a violent confrontation ensued. Tragically, Isaac Black was fatally shot in the head and succumbed to his injuries. Wyatt, although wounded in the left side of the chest, managed to evade capture temporarily before being apprehended a few days later. U.S. Deputies Sheriffs Marion Hildreth and J.W. Meir transported Black's lifeless body in a horse-drawn wagon to Alva for burial. All that remained on his person were modest belongings, his photograph of his wife, Belle, a dollar fifty in silver coins, and copies of two ballads. Isaac Black laid to rest in an unadorned pauper's grave at the Alva Municipal Cemetery, and he was buried at the county's expense. Charles E. Bowles, commonly known as Black Bart, was a captivating American outlaw who etched his name into the history books with the poetic messages he left behind during his daring robberies. His magnetic personality earned him the nickname Charlie amongst his companions, and he was sometimes known as Charles or C.E. With an air of elegance and sophistication, (laughs) he embodied the essence of a gentleman bandit, becoming a legendary figure notorious for his exploits in Northern California and Southern Oregon during the 1870s and 1880s. Charles was born in England, and at the age of two, they made the move from England to Jefferson County, New York to settle their family in America. He was fueled by the fervor of the California Gold Rush, and him and his brother David and James embarked on a quest in 1849 to find their own riches in California. They did return home in 1852, but fate beckoned the Bulls back to the West Coast. Unfortunately for his brothers David and Robert, both of them succumbed to illness as soon as they arrived, and Charles was to remain in California for the next two years, but eventually the disappointment of his brothers and his lack of success made him retrace his steps to the east. In 1854, there was a significant turning point in Bull's life, and he married the love of his life, a woman named Mary Elizabeth Johnson. And by the dawn of 1860, the couple had found themselves in Decatur, Illinois, raising their four children in their humble abode. The eruption of the Civil War beckoned Bowles to don the uniform of a private 
in the Company B, 116th Illinois Regiment. Remarkably, his exemplary service and unwavering dedication earned him the rank of First Sergeant within a year. He fought valiantly and witnessed the horrors of battle, including the fateful encounter, encounter at the Battle of Vicksburg. And later, he joined Sherman's march to the sea. Recognized for his valor, he received commissions as both Second Lieutenant and First Lieutenant. On June 7th of 1865, he was honorably discharged alongside his regiment in the hollowed grounds of Washington, D.C., where he was finally reunited with his family in Illinois. Driven by an insatiable thirst for adventure and fortune, he once found his lure to the unknown. In 1867, he embarked on a journey to Idaho and Montana, embracing the arduous life as a gold prospector. A surviving letter from August of 1871 reveals a troubling encounter with Wells Fargo and company agents, further igniting the flames of revenge that built within him. Tragically, his wife never received another letter, leading her to believe that he had perished in the treacherous wilderness. Thus emerged the criminal career of the enigmatic Black Bart. Donning his infamous moniker, he proceeded to terrorize Wells Fargo stagecoaches, perpetrating a staggering 28 watt robberies across the landscapes of Northern California between 1875 and 1883. His audacious exploits extended along the historic Siskiyou Trail. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. I think it's Siskiyou or Siskiyou. Um, either way, the Siskiyou Trail that weaves between California and Oregon. Although he only left behind two poetic gems, one at the fourth and one at the fifth robbery sites, these verses became his signature, ensuring that his name would echo through time. Black Bart's ventures proved overwhelmingly fruitful, amassing him a fortune that often reached thousands of dollars per year, and given the time, it'd be a lot of money. Black Bart was a captivating with his criminal prowess. He actually was plagued by irrational fears of horses, which is kind of shocking given the time, but he executed all of his heists on foot. He would adorn a long linen duster coat and crowned with a stylish bowler hat. He concealed his identity behind a makeshift mask crafted from a flour sack uh, and had holes cut out to, so he could see. A shotgun remained firmly gripped in his hands, but he never resorted to violence capturing the attention of the public and cementing his image as an anomaly in the realm of outlaws. Bowles maintain a consistent air of politeness and refrain from using foul language, despite its occasional presence in his poetic verses. He conducted himself with refined demeanor, leaving a lasting impression on all who encountered him. His signature attire, paired with his nonchalant approach to his criminal endeavors, became the defining traits of Black Bart's unforgettable persona. The chronicles of Black Bart's criminal exploits started in July 26th of 1875, when he orchestrated his maiden stagecoach robbery in California. Commanding a deep and resonant voice, he politely instructed stage driver John Shine to surrender the coveted strongbox. With a commanding gesture, he warned, Quote, if he dares to shoot, give him a solid volley, boys, prompting Shine to swiftly relinquish his prize. After Black Bart vanished into thin air, Shine ventured to retrieve the strongbox, only to discover that the menacing rifle barrel protruded from the nearby bush was nothing more than a carefully orchestrated decoy. Black Bart's audacious debut gave him about $160. The curtain fell on Black Bart's career with his final robbery of November 3rd of 1883 at the very location that his first heist had unfolded, a place called Funk Hill, nestled southeast of present-day Copperopolis. Concealing his visage behind his familiar flower sack mast, he initiated his calculated assault on the stagecoach driven by Reason McConnell. Pretty cool name. I've never heard the name Reason. Uh, as it crossed the Reynolds Ferry along the age-old route of the Sonora to Milton. At the ferry, a man named Jimmy Rolari, son of the ferry owner, eagerly joined the stage armed with his trusty rifle. Descending at the foot of the hill to embark on a hunting excursion along the creek, Rolari intended to reunite with the stage on the other end. As he reached the western end of the summit, 
he saw the stage driver with a team of horses. Reason McConnell shared the tale of Bowles' ambush, recounting how the outlaw had emerged from behind a boulder, brandishing his shotgun at the stage approaching its zenith. Forcing Reason McConnell to unhitch the team and transport them across the crest of the hill, Black Bart was able to turn his attention to the elusive strongbox with the stagecoach still there. To his dismay, he encountered it in an unexpected hurdle. The box had been securely bolted to the floor and required substantial effort to dislodge. As Reese McConnell and Jimmy Rolari ascended the hill, they glimpsed at Black Bart uh, moving himself from the stage while he was clutching the precious strongbox. Reese McConnell grabbed Rolari's rifle and took two shots at the fleeing bandit, but he missed. Jimmy Rolari seized his opportunity and fired at Black Bart himself as he retreated into the concealment of thick foliage. Black Bart stumbled, seemingly struck by the bullet. Racing towards the thicket, the pursuers discovered a small, blood-stained parcel, a bundle of mail the outlaw had inadvertently dropped. Wounded in the hand, Black Bart continued his desperate flight until he reached a quarter mile mark where he succumbed to exhaustion. Grasping a tattered handkerchief, he staunchly wrapped it around his hand to curb the bleeding. Finding his solace behind a decaying log, he actually stashed the gold within that in like a hidden recess, uh, retaining just $500 in gold coins. Concealing his shotgun within the hollow of a mighty tree, he abandoned all other remnants of his criminal past and vanished into the abyss. In a manuscript scribed by the driver, Reason McConnell, nearly two decades after the heist, he claimed to have discharged all four rounds at Black Bart. Though he thought he missed his mark, McConnell surmised that either the second or third bullet found its target, while he remained certain that the fourth had struck the elusive outlaw. Curiously, Black Bart suffered only a single wound to his hand. The pursuit of justice ensued once Black Bart's escape concluded, and he unwittingly left behind an assortment of like his personal effects. Among them were his eyeglasses, remnants of his meal, a handkerchief adorned with the laundry mark FX07, Wells Fargo detectives James B. Hume and Harry N. Morse embarked on a quest uh, meticulously visiting nearly 90 laundries throughout San Francisco in search of the origins of the mysterious mark. The tenacity of their search uh, landed them to Ferguson and Biggs California Laundry on Bush Street, where they unearthed a vital clue. Ownership of the handkerchief belonged to a resident of a modest boarding house. Unraveling it further, Detectives unveiled a portrait of Black Bart as a self-proclaimed mining engineer, frequently embarking on, quote, business trips, his thefts, the business trips, that conveniently coincided with Wells Fargo's ill-fated encounters. Initially denying any association with Black Bart, Charles Bowles eventually admitted to his involvement in multiple stagecoach robberies. However, he only confessed to crimes committed before 1879 and he believed that the statute of limitations had lapsed for his earlier crimes. When formally booked, he identified himself as T.Z. Spaulding, but the authorities stumbled upon a Bible, a cherished gift from his wife inscribed with his true name. The police painted Bowles as, quote, a person of great endurance, who exhibited genuine wit under the most trying circumstances, and was extremely proper and polite in behavior. Ultimately, Black Bart faced justice and received six-year sentence in San Quentin Prison for the final robbery. However, his exemplary conduct during his prison sentence earned him an early, early release after just four years, in January of 1888. His time behind bars had taken a visible toll on his well-being, marked by visible aging, failing eyesight, and partial deafness in one ear. Reporters besieged him upon his liberation, inquiring if he had harbored intentions of resuming his criminal exploits. With a disarming smile, he responded, he responded, quote, No, gentlemen, I'm through with crime. I didn't do a British accent, but I just figured I'd try to smart it up a little bit. Uh, Bowles on his release never returned to his wife, although he did maintain a correspondence with her. In one of his letters, he expressed weariness from the constant surveillance of Wells Fargo, 
a sense of demoralization and an urgent desire to escape the shackles of society. In February of 1888, Bowles abruptly just vanished, bidding farewell to the Nevada house and slipping into the realm of obscurity. Hume, the person who helped investigate him from Wells Fargo, claimed that Wells Fargo had traced him to the Visalia House uh, Hotel in Visalia, but the hotel owner attested that the figure's check-in um, was just kind of a disappearance. Uh, the sighting of Black Bart on February 28th of 1888 marked the final trace of the notorious outlaw. His ultimate fate and the circumstances of his later life are a mystery, and they, we do not know what happened to him when he left that hotel. The legend of Black Bart endures as an embodiment of the extraordinary and inexplicable things that happened in the Wild West. A gentleman bandit who adorned the pages of history with poetic verse, he captured the imagination of the public, and he carved his place in the annals of outlaw lore. The tale of Black Bart serves as a testament to the allure of the Wild West, where figures like him roamed the untamed frontier, defying conventions and leaving behind a legacy that continues to captivate generations of fans, including pretty much everybody on this channel. Before we end this episode, please don't leave because I am going to read the poems that he left that are authenticated to be Black Bart's poems he left at uh, his robberies. This first one was found at the scene August 3rd of 1877 during a stage holdup from Point Arena to Duncan's Mills, California. This is the following poem. Quote, I've labored long and hard for bread, for honor and for riches, but on my corns too long you tread, you fine-haired sons of bitches. Black Bart, 1877. The second verse was left at the site of his July 25th, 1878 holdup of a stage traveling from Quincy to Oroville, California. And here it is, quote, Here I lay me down to sleep, to wait the coming morrow, Perhaps success, perhaps defeat, and everlasting sorrow. Let come what will, I'll try it on. My condition can't be worse. And if there's money in that box, tis money in my purse. Black Bart, that's my favorite one. The other one was kind of funny because I said, you fine hair sons of bitches. Tis money in my purse sounds way cooler as an outlaw of the Wild West. I hope you really enjoyed this one. I didn't know about this outlaw. Uh, one of our listeners uh, sent this one uh, that I should be researching this one. So I hope you enjoyed this one. And we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks, y'all.